Okie doke. So, got a lot of different things to say about the Rivian. We've had it for several months and um, about 3,600 miles at this point. Um, enough to experience sort of what it's like in, in all regards. Um, I'll break it down for the good and the bad. The good is I, I, I was really worried about the sound system um, before buying it because I spend too much on, time on, you know, Reddit and researching cars and YouTube and, and everything else. Um, and a lot of people had negative things to say about the sound system. Um, and I got the base sound system in this. I did consider getting the upgraded sound system. Um, and I'm so glad I didn't. Uh, I'm sure that the upgraded sound system is better. This sound system is great. Um, audio experiences are definitely, you know, individualized. Um, everybody hears things a little bit differently. Uh, this sound system's great. It's totally fine. It's just, it's on par with um, the Maki, my wife's Mustang Maki, um, Bang and Olufsen sound system. Um, the Bose sound system that my daughter has is, you know, this is a little bit better, I think. It has really good low notes. Um, maybe there's a little bit of high notes missing, but it's really a great sound system. Uh, if you're an audiophile, you might notice it's lacking or something. Nobody else, you know, unless you're really into audio, audio this is a great sound system. It really is. And this is just, again, the base in-house Rivian sound system. I think it's great. So the storage is amazing. I've said that in my other videos, um, but I really can't say enough. Like at the demo drive, I took all kinds of stuff with me, um, car seats, booster seats, the stroller, uh, my big cooler that we take to the beach. A bunch of uh, oh suitcases um, that we normally travel with, like our big um, check luggage uh, suitcases, the rolling ones. I tell, I brought everything, and I highly encourage anyone who's curious about an R1S to go do a demo drive, because fitting everything in when you've got the the trunk is huge because it's very rectangular. It's got you know the R1S has a flat back. So you can stack a lot of stuff in there from top to bottom. So when you look at the floor space at the bottom of the trunk, um, it's it's very rectangular and that goes all the way to the ceiling. There's no, like the, the back doesn't lean over like this, like my uh, Highlander or my Explorer did, which were much, you know, they had sort of a curved trunk. So you could get the the big suitcases in laying down but you couldn't stand them up. And then you had to sort of stack smaller stuff on top of the suitcase and make a pyramid to close the trunk. You don't have that issue with this, which is really awesome. Um, then on top of that, you've got the basement underneath, which is huge, it really is. You can get uh, an entire cooler under there. There's a few YouTube videos of people doing that. I've done it. Um, and then you've got the front still, which is gigantic. It's like having a whole extra Highlander trunk just at the front. It's huge, it's really gigantic. So you can get all kinds of stuff. Um, stuff in the front does seem to get warm. I wouldn't say hot, but it gets warm. Stuff in the uh, back stays nice and cool. Obviously you've got the cabin air going. And if you put bottles or anything in this center console, um, then it actually stays pretty chilly. It's not refrigerated, but the um, ducts run the rear air underneath and it stays very cool. Um, obviously in the winter time, it's going to stay warm if I'm running the heat. The seats are really supportive. They're very well sculpted. Um, so I just feel nestled. I don't feel like I'm cramped or anything's pinching or anything like that, but I feel really comfortable. The headrests are good, they're well positioned. Um, and the only drawback to the seats is right now my wife is pregnant and she complains that these seats are not designed for people with wide hips. Um, I think that's kind of to, something to do with where the seat belts clip in. Um, but I also think that once she's not pregnant anymore, um, that won't be an issue. 
I, I don't think she's particularly comfortable anywhere at the moment. So, um, but the seats are very comfortable. The ventilated seats I really appreciate. Um, they're not particularly powerful ventilated seats, um, but you can definitely tell black leather in San Diego is uh, sort of a no-go. Um, but being perforated, they're a little bit better, but then ventilated as well, it's, it's totally fine, it's good. Everything in here feels very high quality. So um, I will say the steering wheel in my Toyota Highlander, I believe was real leather. Um, and that felt really nice. So this uh, steering wheel feels a little um, rougher material, but I also think it's gonna be more durable. The In 15,000 miles, the steering wheel in my Highlander already had some blemishes and defects in, in, in the material. Um, and I actually tried to warranty that really early, like less than 5,000 miles, and they refused. So I don't think that's gonna be an issue with this material. The dash is nice uh, material. Um, it's the same as the steering wheel and other touch points. I don't really feel like anything in here is cheap. It all feels nice. It, it also feels durable. It doesn't feel luxury like a Range Rover or something, um, but it does feel nice. It's, it's a nice place to be. On that note, it feels like everything in here is absolutely solid. It feels like there are solid iron beams running through each side of the car and that the dash is sculpted out of another iron iron beam. Everything just feels solid. There's no squeaks or anything like that when you're going over uneven surfaces. Our driveway at the bottom of the hill goes from a flat road to a very steep angle, and it's a tight turn. And I've never had a car coming up that before that you don't hear the rubber seals and the doors kind of squeak as the car flexes. Um, this doesn't do any of that. It's absolutely solid. The driving experience in this is a dream. It's not Rolls Royce to the point you feel nothing. Um, there are probably better riding cars out there, but for a three row family SUV that can off-road and tow and is also extremely comfortable, it's amazing. Um, some people report a floaty sensation. I don't really feel that. I feel a very buttoned down um, tight sensation. It is soft, it's a nice ride, um, but it can be stiff. Um, the faster you go, the less it sort of seems to take out things like potholes. The slower you go, the, the more it handles them. Um, anyone from San Diego that knows Highway 52 um, over by Convoy Street, um, the Convoy exit, there's a, it's a notoriously badly made freeway. Um, we could get into that, but it, it literally is like a roller coaster for like, I don't know, half a mile or a mile. And you just go over and over and over these bumps and I found right away I, this suspension blew my mind you go over the first one and then you sort of feel the SUV height when you crest the first bump it stays high and then you feel the wheels moving up and down but the car the SUV itself isn't moving it's it's solid so as the rest of the bumps go you, you're not getting porpoising like I did in my Highlander um, or any jarring kind of bumps in like I did in my Explorer. Um, this is a really nice mix of, you can wing it around a corner and it's not leaning like the Tower of Pisa. You can um, drive it in twisty mountain roads and it stays flat which I genuinely believe helps my family with motion sickness, especially in the back. Um, and it soaks up all the bumps. I've never felt a bump in here ever um, in all of my driving that was jarring or um, unexpectedly or unreasonably unpleasant. So yeah, there are big potholes every once in a while here or there like road construction and steel plates or whatever that you feel them 
but nothing that's um, unpleasant or unreasonable. So you're going to feel the road in vehicles. Um, and that's part of what I like about this actually is that you do feel engaged and you do feel the road. Um, it's not a BMW, but um, it for a three row SUV, it handles really, really well. So as I was saying about the motion sickness, I do think, and, and my um, seven-year-old daughter did just say on a road trip up into the mountains this weekend that she has not felt road sick at all that whole trip, which was unheard of. If anyone's going to get road sick, it's her. Um, she was in the second row. We Obviously, we had the air conditioning and everything going, but this is through really unpleasant, twisty roads. If anyone knows the area, we went up to Lake Coyamaca. Um, and there's some twisties up there. Uh, so we were keeping up with traffic. Um, nothing was unpleasant. Uh, it stays flat and it's very smooth because there's no gears. Even when you're going up those steep inclines and up at really high elevation, the engine isn't working hard. You don't have unpleasant engine noise. You don't have gear shifts halfway around a corner or at unexpected times, you know, where it's up shifting when you're leaving a corner and then you slow down and you've got the downshift downshift and then up shift up shift it's just it's smooth it's quiet it's it really is a nice place to be continuing on the the note of good things that i like about this um there is space for adults in all three rows and it's not uncomfortable even in the third row so is it where I want to spend, you know, a thousand miles each way on a road trip? Probably not. But honestly, as a six foot four, 250 pound man, I am totally comfortable in all three rows with the seats in my position. So if I were to sit in all three with my seats adjusted for my comfort in all three rows, it's totally comfortable. It's, uh, it, it's a good place to be. So I can sit here or here or here, um, the bad things. This, I'll start off with a lame one. I wish it had more cup holders at front. Um, that was something my expedition did really well. There was like 10 cup holders up front or something. There was the pop-out style like the R1S has, but then there were two built-in ones behind it because you know wireless charging wasn't a thing back then. So that's space being taken up with the R1S now is two wireless chargers. Um, but man, I just, I would love, I don't know, so put them somewhere. I'd love to have a couple more cup holders, even if they were down in the doors as kind of the bump outs, you know, that doors get, that would be helpful. Um, it's a gripe. I manage without, it's not the end of the world. More of an issue I would say is the occasionally quirky software. Uh, I'll get into car playing things in a second, but as far as actual Rivian software, excluding infotainment and phone connectivity and stuff like that, just looking at how the software operates the vehicle, it's very hit or miss. So as far as software is operating the actual vehicle for air con heating and air controls or suspension controls in this case, or anything else, um, it can be a bit inconsistent. When you are driving, it will automatically lower the suspension on freeways and things like that to reduce drag and get um, better range. The issue is um, then it's bumpy, so I don't like that. So I turn it off. I don't know why I can't seem to see a consistent reason or a consistent thing that I'm doing that's making this happen, but um, it'll go through phases where every time I put it in drive, it will go back to automatic mode for the suspension. I will go and turn it off um, and I feel it either in the ride I, and I press the button and turn it off or I notice it. There's a very tiny little A on the dashboard um, next to the suspension modes. So if it has that A, I know it's in automatic mode. So it goes through phases where every time I put it in drive, it will turn back on. I turn it off. I go park somewhere. I come back. I put it in drive and it comes on again. And I don't know what I'm doing, but then it will go through a whole week or two without doing it once. And it just stays in standard mode the whole time. So quirky software. 
Okay, so here's the suspension thing I'm talking about. I'll turn it on here. Um, I don't know why that comes on so frequently and then randomly won't come on for a while. Unfortunately, um, it doesn't always recognize when kids get in the car. So I don't know why, but if I get in, I'll show you. Um, but then going to the um, climate control here, I it knows I'm the only one in the car right now. So it's only got the front air on and it's in my last settings. That's great. Um, but then when my kids get in, sometimes I will check and this isn't on. So I've got to go manually turn it in and more frequently than the middle. The middle, I would say is 80% of the time will turn it on correctly when the kids get in the car, that's good. But then when they're sitting in the back, I know it knows there's kids in the back, right? Cause it knows if the seat belts are buckled or not. So I don't understand why I have to come in here probably 50% of the time or more um, and turn that on because for some reason, um, the car has not turned the air back on there. That made my son really sick on a road trip because uh, he was getting no air and he was sitting back there. Um, he didn't tell me that he wasn't getting any air, so I didn't do anything about it until he complained and then I checked and, and felt bad for him. One other thing is, yes, it does now have Apple Music and I appreciate that, that's awesome. However, um, what I'm uh, frustrated with is there is no Apple CarPlay. So I actually think that's dangerous. It's not because I'm an Apple fan, but there is no way to text. This is the worst part. This is the biggest drawback to having this vehicle is every other car I have has Apple CarPlay. My daughter's 2018 Nissan Leaf has Apple CarPlay. I can text or my wife or my daughter can text in those cars. When we're in this car and I get a text message, there is no way to answer that text message, to see what it says, none of the rest of it. And I can't uh, rely on my wife at work to know, oh, he's in the car right now. So I should call him instead of texting or whatever. If she's busy and she's got 30 seconds to fire off a text, hey, can you put this on for dinner? Do you think you can get some rice going? Hey, did you drop off such and such for the girls or whatever the, the communication is? I don't know. Um, so I'm a bit ashamed to admit it, but I think it's unfortunately a reality. I checked my phone. Um, so at least that way, okay, it's my wife. I better see what she's saying at the next stoplight or whatever. Um, or, oh, it's a telemarketer. I'm not going to respond. But the fact that I take my eyes off the road and look down at my phone on the wireless charging before I look up, I understand this has adaptive safety features. And in theory, it shouldn't hit somebody else on the road. It just increases the risk and the likelihood of all the software things, Rivian, please, please fix that one. It is really idiotic for a brand new car. This is a 2025 Gen 2 R1S, not to have any way to hear or respond to text messages. In the days of, like I said, my daughter's 2018 Nissan Leaf, has Apple CarPlay and I can dictate texts and everything else and never take my eyes off the road. Um, I don't know what, you know, bees need to get under somebody's bonnet over at Rivian, but please, this is genuinely, I believe, a safety issue. I know I'm, I, I am ashamed to admit that I look at my phone. It is dangerous, it, I shouldn't. Um, this is the only car I do that in. In the other cars, I literally never do. I never have to. So in today's day and age, when you're buying a brand new car, whether it's a base model Corolla or a top of the line Range Rover, it needs to have 
some form of texting and communication abilities. It's, it's really not acceptable. I can't state that enough that it is genuinely a safety issue. So am I the only one, you know, I see people in brand new cars that I know do have CarPlay and they're still holding their phone to their cheek or they're texting or whatever, but that's not an excuse for me to continually, oh, I've got a text, let me see what that is. And then it's just, it doesn't need to happen. It's completely avoidable. Rivian, please, if you fix anything in the next update, please understand how important that issue is, especially to a dad when I've got all my kids in the car or the dog or what have you, or other drivers or pedestrians on the road. It's unnecessary. It is not safe and it needs to be fixed. That is the worst thing about the Rivian so far. So I'm sure they've said repeatedly that they're going to fix that, that they're going to do something about it. Um, but I, apparently they were telling Gen 1 owners that too and nothing's been done yet. So I love the car. It is worth all of the negative things to me. I think all the good vastly outweighs the bad, but that one, there's no excuse Rivian fix it. We do have Apple Music and whatnot in my family. We share a plan for our family. Not having Siri be able to, you know, oh, Siri play, blah, 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 is super frustrating. And then when we get in the car, I get that it's got Apple Music native, but it, it very rarely, if ever, continues playing whatever you were playing when you get in the car. So if it's on Apple Music, it pops up and then it just sits there. So unless you physically interact with it and make it keep playing, then it won't. And even when you do keep playing a song, you, you manually go through, you press the button, make it play, then it's gonna restart the song you are halfway through, which drives me nuts. If I stop somewhere for two seconds to pick up my wife's coffee or whatever, I get out of the car, I get immediately back in the car within less than five minutes. I want that song to keep playing exactly where it was. I might have been jamming out. So that's a frustration. What is the best thing about the Rivian? And I will say absolutely, it's the efficiency. Um, this is gonna vary person to person. For me, it is the efficiency. So we have solar panels um, and it covers all of my electricity for all my vehicles. I will insert a little um, picture. Uh, it's a, a pie chart of where stg &E, our utility company, estimates our electricity usage is going. Um, I'm very careful to only charge the cars, you know, in our proper time of use to save the cost um, and be kind to the grid and all of that. But um, my solar panels cover uh, before we had EVs, we made about five times the electricity that our house actually consumed. That was awesome. But now um, it covers all of what my house consumes, plus all three of my EVs together, which is awesome. Um, the fact that I can drive a three row SUV and it's powered by the sun from solar panels on my house that's super cool. Um, you know, that that's, I understand that the panels themselves are not actually charging my EV. Um, but I make that much electricity. It goes to the grid and offsets what I use. Um, so it just put itself in park. So I really love the efficiency. I can drive three, including this big off-road towing capable, comfortable, fast, three row SUV for so little electricity, so little energy, that's so cool. What does consume more electricity than all three of my EVs combined is my air conditioner. Um, I actually had it checked out. I thought it might be broken, uh, that it used so much electricity. Um, I looked at the readout and again, it's in that pie chart that I just showed with SDG and E. Um, my air conditioner alone uses more than twice the electricity of all three of my EVs combined. That's amazing. Um, so again, that just shows if you have an air conditioner on your house, 
um, and you have an older, less efficient home like I do, that air conditioner is running a lot to keep it cool, then it's gonna be more expensive to air condition your home than it is to drive your car. That's incredible to move this much mass this quickly, comfortably, that's incredible. I really love that, I can't get over it. Um, so yes, I will put more solar on and probably do a battery system. Um, and if I do that, I will probably make some videos about that as well to make sure that my AC use is also covered. Um, but the fact that this is covered by my solar output that's really amazing. I love that. Okay, so every vehicle is a compromise in some way. There's no perfect vehicle. Minivans are arguably, I mean, every, anyone who's had one knows they're just better use of space than 99% of vehicles on the road. Um, they are, you can get cargo in them for days. They have really flexible seating arrangements. Um, Many of them aren't all-wheel drive. Um, they're not the most efficient things. Um, they're not fast. They're not good off-road. They can't tow very much. So there are compromises. They are still big and sometimes difficult to park. Um, so I have looked at minivans. I've looked at full-size SUVs. And for a family that has a checklist of things they want to do, the Arminus has the least compromises on that list of cargo is amazing, cargo capacity. And as I've said in my other videos, I really do think um, that because of the way the cargo is organized, split into the front, the trunk, and the basement, it's actually better cargo space. It's more usable than uh, cargo space in a full-size SUV like a Suburban or an Expedition Max, or even a minivan. Um, just because you have less things piled on top of other things. You know, you don't have uh, this pyramid of, of um, stuff you're trying to cram in the car. Um, you can organize it in, in a more accessible way that's better for things that, you know, um, are less... Uh, you, things you don't want to get crushed or, um, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, so I do think the cargo layout and accessibility in an R1S is the best. Again, as I've said before, this thing's just a Swiss army knife for families. Like you can do just about anything. It doesn't tow the most. Um, it doesn't, uh, you know, compared to like full-size SUVs, this is 1300 pounds short of most full-size SUVs. If you think Suburbans and Expeditions generally um, with max tow packages and things are around 9,000, 9,200. This is 7,700, so 1,300, 1,500 less than those. Um, it's still an enormous amount for a vehicle of this size. Um, the efficiency, uh, it'd be just because it's an EV, the way it uses electricity or the way it uses fuel or energy is a lot better than anything else you know, in the ice world. Um, so this has all, it, it checks the most boxes on that list of being the best vehicle possible for my family. Um, and I, I do think that Rivian engineers and the Rivian team did put this in a, a really great space um, that is accessible to families um, and as years go on and used ones become available, it will only become more accessible to more families. Um, it's just, if you're looking at a new vehicle at the moment for your family, um, that's this kind of size or this kind of capability, you're looking at a lot of money these days. That's just how it is. Um, so I, I do think though that the Rivian team made this in such a way it's not too fancy um, you know, it's not a, a luxury vehicle per se. Everything in here feels like it has purpose 
everything feels like it was actually intended to be used. Um, I have even used the flashlight in the door a few times. I dropped my keys down by the mailbox the other day and I had left my phone in here. So I just quick, instead of coming all the way back in, grabbing my phone, going back, I just quick grabbed the flashlight out of the door, found my keys and uh, was good to go. Um, you know, it, it just, it's solid. It's built with purpose. It can do an amazing amount of things. <clears throat> and the fold down center seat is actually super useful for getting two by fours and things at Home Depot um, or anything else longer like that you might be trying to put in the car. It, everything, it, it's supposed to be used. Everything cleans up easily. Um, the sound system's great. It's a really great place to be. It's flexible. I can use the seats in all different positions and accommodate a wide variety of things. Um, you know, as a family currently of six, almost where in a few more months, we're going to be a family of seven. Um, that's, I mean, I literally am going to have a kiddo in every seat and I'm not worried about cargo capacity or anything else. Um, with Highlanders and Explorers, and even when I was looking at Sequoias and uh, Expeditions, you know, standards instead of Expedition Max, um, I was looking at those and thinking, if I buy one of these, I'm still gonna need a roof box to get all my stuff inside to do road trips. And then you're already looking at a relatively inefficient vehicle, a gas guzzler. Um, and then you're gonna add a roof box. You're gonna drop one or two miles per gallon easily with a roof box. Um, so yeah, I don't feel guilty about driving this. It does so many things so well. Uh, is it perfect? No, but do I forgive um, the negatives? Yeah, absolutely. I would buy this thing over again all day long. Uh, I just, I, I couldn't stress enough. This isn't for everybody. Um, just because not everybody needs a vehicle this size. Not, you know, cost aside. Um, it Again, I've made the point. If you're looking for a family vehicle um, with the capabilities that this has, then it's priced well. But if you're, you know, looking for something used or something else, there's nothing really out there yet um, for, in the EV world. Um, that can meet the things that this does. But even if you're looking new, if you don't need the third row, maybe your kids would be more comfortable in a Telluride with one row across. Or maybe you don't need that much cargo capacity, so a Telluride will work for you anyway. Um, the ID Buzz is imminently launching. I expect it'll be overpriced for a year or so, um, and then we should see some reasonable models. Um, it's maybe not as advanced, but it might check a lot of the same boxes too. Uh, I do think we're kind of on the cusp of a lot of cool new vehicles um, coming out that are, you know, beneficial as EVs. Um, fun to drive um, if that's what you want. Plain to drive if that's not what you want. Um, good cargo capacity or extra seating or, you know, we're, we're in a short time period of big change. Um, and I think at the end of the day, whether that change forces um, internal combustion engine, you know, traditional manufacturers to do better um, themselves or whether they produce EVs or whatever the situation is, the competition and the way that EVs have shaken up the auto industry are really beneficial. So. Um, I will in future, if I do add solar and batteries, um, I will go over that system. A big um, benefit to EVs for me is the fact that I can offset, you know, all my energy usage, um, especially here in San Diego. Again, that's not something that is necessarily something everyone, you know, can do. Um, but I'll do some future videos. I do love driving something that I know um, you know, I have produced enough electricity that when I'm charging at nighttime, that's a wash. Um, so if only I didn't need air conditioning, then uh, we'd really be set. So um, 
if I do end up putting more panels on and batteries and building my own fuel station to power all of the things we do, uh, I'll, I'll let you know. Um, otherwise, feel free to ask questions about the R1S. Let me know if I've missed something. I, I could not recommend it enough. These were too expensive and sort of unobtainium for normal people until the Gen 2 sort of came out. Um, they're still not that old. There's not that many of them out, although I am seeing more and more. Um, so, but keep in mind, you don't have to get a tri-motor or even a dual performance or, you know, the insane quad motor. You can keep the price down and these really are competitive um, with similar ICE vehicles. These things are so great. So um, that's all I got to say about it. Have a good one.